This video, I'm going to be taking you through uh, what Lockbit ransomware is, uh, also how it works within the ransomware as a service model, and give a little bit of an explanation around, I guess, the vast majority of ransomware attacks, which are criminally financially motivated versus ICS specific uh, threat actors that Dragos are tracking and, and looking for. Um, that's not to say that ransomware can't be used as a offensive strategic option to disrupt or deny an organization. It's just that it's not as common as financially motivated crime is. So what I want to go through first, um, and I'll provide all these links as part of the video on Confluence so you can go read it at your own pace. Microsoft has this article on uh, ransomware as a service and how it kind of comes together. So you've got the access broker here on the left, uh, they're the ones that are compromising organizations and then selling the credentials on the dark web. You've got the uh, ransomware as a service operator on the right here. They're the ones that are developing and maintaining the tools. So when we talk about Lockpoint, uh, Lockbit 3.0 um, or Lockbit Black as it's also known, they're the software developers and they also provide uh, kind of like this flashy service where uh, if you compromise someone, you can upload the data and they have kind of like a uh, like a marketplace essentially where people can go look for compromised data and, and pay for it or pay for it to be taken down. And then what you have is uh, ransomware as a service affiliate. So when we talk about threat groups in ransomware cases, when they're financially motivated and doing the double extortion where they're taking data, when we talk about threat groups, what we're usually talking about is the affiliate. So someone who just purchases uh, the credentials from the access brokers and also purchases the platform or the ransomware as a service. So ransomware as a service, I have seen anywhere from $1,000 US for one term use to five grand for lifetime access to that service. The downside is you don't get any warranties on that. So if they go out of business, then that lifetime guarantee is no longer uh, maintained for that ransomware as a service. So you kind of like pick and choose your battles because um, you may want to do a full campaign where you're purchasing for a lifetime, but you're going to do that campaign over two months and hit a lot of customers. Um, and financially, that might be, as a criminal, financially, that might be better for you. But it's important to, to note here that when people talk about threat groups, a whole bunch of different threat groups could use ransomware as a service, but because the TTPs are similar because they're just purchasing an off-the-shelf product, essentially. It's less useful in these cases to perform attribution because it doesn't really matter who it is. Uh, the questions that customers usually want asked in, in the ransomware and criminal cases, and, and they will ask for attribution. I'm just, it's not that useful because you can't gain anything from it. The other questions that they, they want answered are, uh, how did they get in? What did they do? And what did they take? Um, particularly in ransomware cases, that last one, what did they take? Because you've then got reporting requirements to the different government bodies for if you've had PII taken. So what I want to get into next is uh, the Lockbit ransomware itself and kind of where it's evolved. Um, so this article came out in September 2022, and it was essentially a disgruntled employee or affiliate with Lockbit. Um, they released essentially the source code or the, the builder for Lockbit. So um, it's we'll get into that in a sec. It's pretty easy to use and generate your own ransomware. What happened here was there was a whole bunch of copycat uh, ransomware groups that spawned out of this because you could just make it own. You could customize it yourself and, and deploy it. And it's really, really easy to use. We'll see here. We'll get into the builder and the config in a sec. But I guess it's important to note what was happening. So this was originally released on three exports here on their, they um, are a security researcher. They released it on their GitHub. If we now go to their GitHub, this repository is being disabled because it is live malware. It still is really effective um, in encrypting endpoints, but we are able to to get this. There, there are kind of like, I guess, research versions. There's still um, versions out there that have other malware built in, but um, the one that I'm going to show you today, I pulled off VirusTotal, which is a um, malware database and scanning service online. So we'll get into the build files. So it runs off a build batch file. Essentially, you click this and it'll build everything for you. 
um, the application will take the keygen application and the config um, and put it all together in this build directory for us. So if we look in this build directory, there's nothing at the moment. Um, for those interested, we'll have a look at the build batch file here. Um, so what it does first is it clears out the build directory that is the directory in here that we, we just looked at. Um, and then you can see here, it's um, using the keygen uh, application that I mentioned, and then it's using the builder application after that to um, make all these files. So these are options that are being passed into each of the applications or the executables, and then it's building stuff for us. Um, if we come across to the config, so this is where you can kind of make it yourself. So you can give it uh, a UID, a key. We can see there's a whole bunch of settings in here. So encrypt mode set to auto. auto. Um, you can get it to encrypt file names. So um, this is useful if you wanted to make it even harder for customers to figure out, or victims, sorry, to figure out what was encrypted on their endpoints. Yeah, there's a whole bunch more kind of flexibility in here. We can see the white folders. So I believe these are the folders that it's not going into to encrypt. Um, some of this is really important because if you encrypt system files, you corrupt the file system, which means nothing's recoverable. You essentially just want to aim to encrypt the user files, which are things like um, PDFs, DocX, uh, Excel spreadsheets, and in the user-based locations. You don't kind of want to wreck the computer because your model is extortion to then decrypt the files. Uh, if we come down here, there is a, a variable within um, the config for a note. So when you see a lot of copycat attackers, they won't really change any of this. Um, they may change like the links and the payment amount, but because this was built for the Lockbit as a service, uh, it would generate a decryption ID. And then if you were the affiliate, you could uh, send this to like Lockbit and go, here's the decryption ID. We want a website for X company that we just ransomware. And they would do all the work kind of in the back end. There's no payment amounts in here as far as I know. Um, the bigger ransomware companies have kind of moved away from that. So they just post the amount on their affiliate web pages. So the Lockbit um, ransomware web page will have like a Bitcoin amount because all of the transaction is then done through there. Um, it means there's less work for the affiliate to do in, in terms of the note. But with the release of this, what we have seen is, is this note has been changed quite a lot uh, for some groups that are copying, that are just using the Lockbit um, binaries to then ransomware customers. Um, so after we've built this, we can go into the build directory. We can see there's a whole bunch of stuff that was used in here. Uh, I haven't played around too much with the past, but I think this will harvest credentials which is kind of like built-in functionality to Lockbit. So if you're up on the current, I guess, ransomware as a service stuff, they're always looking to improve more features or um, you can spend more money to get more features in these kind of things. LB3 is the single application that is pulled across to the client network and then is detonated within their environment. And this, this alone will encrypt the, the endpoints. You don't need any of the rest of this. Usually what you're just playing across is that the rest of this is for the affiliate to use if they need to rebuild it or, or whatever. Um, this will also, once it's run, delete itself, which is helpful here because you can rebuild it. The LB3 decryptor is will decrypt the files if they pay for it. So that's how this whole model works is that you would drop this executable on the victim environment, you would detonate it. We'll see that in a little bit. It'll encrypt all the files and then if they pay their ransom, you would delete the files that you took. It's important to note here that the exfiltration process in this particular version of Lockbit is manual. So the uh, affiliate would have to exfiltrate the data themselves. And then if the victim paid, they would then delete that off their website, supposedly. But in some ransomware as a service operators, uh, the ones who are developing the code, actually have exfiltration built in. So the idea is that you drop the agent on the network or the executable on the network, you would execute it. It would slowly or potentially sometimes as fast as possible, um, depending on how they configured it, would try and exfiltrate the data. 
And then once it had done that, it would then encrypt the, once that had finished, it would then encrypt anything. Because usually what's triggered if victims don't have network monitoring for data exfiltration is they only have um, kind of detections for ransomware. So the, the exfil is done first, and that still enables extortion to some level, even if the ransomware is stopped. Because if you're a company that has PII that doesn't want it kind of exposed to the world, they can still try and extort money out of you because they've taken your data. That is in built into some. It's also built in where they'll give you a separate application for exfiltration, but just not in this one. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you the, the files that I have. So these are just randomly generated files. Um, for example, like this is just junk. If we look into, it's just more junk. Um, and, but what I do want to show you is I've got secrets.txt here. So this could be a PDF, whatever. So the secret password has something to do with goats. Um, and then we're going to close this and we're going to run the ransomware. And we're going to see what happens. We'll show the, the files themselves. So we can see it's changed the icons. It's kind of double, it's changed the file type and we've got the double file type in the name. So this file type means that it's been ransomware. If we have a look at this, it's because that B9VV is a key linked to the customer. So this is the ransom note. When we talk about ransom note, this is, it's usually dropped into like a readme or it'll say like note ransom.note.txt or something. And that's, that's the one that we saw in the config. So if we change the config file, this would be match, mirror the, the config that we saw. Um, but if we look at secrets.txt here and just open it in notepad, this is the encryption working, right? So we knew before the, the password had something to do with goats is what it said. This is what's happening to the customer. So their data is now, they can't access it because it's it's been encrypted. Again, if they paid the ransom and got the decryptor and we run it, this is what it looks like. So lockbit black decryptor. Uh, funnily enough, in old versions of, of lockbit, the decryptor actually didn't work. So even if they paid for it, they wouldn't have been able to decrypt any of their stuff because there was uh, errors in how they implemented. But in Lockbit 3 uh, was the first time that they successfully had this working. Um, and now if we go back, we can see that the files have returned to normal. If we open secrets.txt again, the secret password has something to do with GOAT. So we can see the decryptor has worked, which is, I guess, the point of it. So again, this is an example where I've built it and ransomware a single host. Obviously, if a, and we saw that um, it didn't really encrypt the DLLs or the application files, which is done on purpose to not corrupt the endpoint. So if a threat actor or affiliate group was dumb enough to drop these tools on an endpoint, encrypted it and left it, and we had the decryptor still, we could just decrypt our own files and we would just have to make sure that nothing was exfiltrated. But generally the idea is that they will get this application, drop it on an endpoint, or within an environment and push it across a lot of endpoints, run it all at once and encrypt it, it would delete itself. And then we would have to contact the affiliate to get the decryptor. Hopefully this has helped and explain the difference between ransomware as a service and kind of like threat groups, which we would normally track and, and affiliates of ransomware as a service, which is not as useful as trying to figure out the attribution of who the affiliate is, especially in today's model of ransomware as a service.